For some time now, we've been aware of the continued undermining of traditional Catholicism from some elements of the hierarchy of the church. We've watched as the Franciscan friars of the Immaculate Heart, as well as the attack on the Little Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Redeemer. There have been other attacks as well, often leveled against third order societies of the lay faithful. The attacks always seem to come under the excuse of there being some doctrinal concerns about the orders themselves, and especially when those orders have large amounts of the laity who seek the sacraments from them. We have another case of this that broke in the news late last week, and it hits particularly close to home for me. Th that is the case of the St. Benedict Center, based out of New Hampshire. No, I'm not in New Hampshire. The Benedict Center hits particularly close to home for me for the same reason that you may be familiar with the work of the St. Benedict Center. While I was in RCIA, I discovered rather providentially the work of Brother Andre Marie of the St. Benedict Center. His podcasts and writings, along with the online content of other traditional Catholic voices, helped instill in me a love for the traditional faith of the Church, despite my being at a parish where that might be otherwise difficult to find. In discussing this story, I will present it by first looking at what the media has to about say about the sanctions leveled against them, and then looking at what the diocese has to say, and then I'll present the defense of the St. Benedict Center using their own press releases to accomplish this. You'll see, as I'm sure you've come to expect by now, that the St. Benedict Center is just the latest traditional Catholic order to be targeted by the powers that be for wrong think and nonconformity. Let's get started and be warned, we're entering an extreme bias zone here with my first source. From the Union Leader New Hampshire-based Only Catholics Go to Heaven group sanctioned by church, aspiring nun allegedly held against her will by a propagandist named Damian Fisher. Richmond, the radical traditionalist Catholic group, the Slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, is now under sanction from the Roman Catholic Church for failing to follow Catholic teaching, according to documents released Monday. The sanctions, which range from a ban on routine Catholic sacraments at the Richmond compound to a revision of IRS documents that describe them as Catholic, could be ratcheted up if the group does not comply with orders by church leaders, especially orders to stop preaching the doctrine that only Catholics go to heaven. They must also stop describing themselves or presenting their teachings as Catholic, something the Vatican ordered them to do two years ago. Quote, they regularly use semantics to mislead people, end quote, said Reverend George Georges de Lair, the vicar for canonical affairs for the Diocese of Manchester. The sanctions follow a report that an adult woman is being held against her will at the compound in Richmond, a town on the Massachusetts border south of Keene. De Lair said the woman, who is in her early 20s, has taken supposed vows to eventually become a nun. Her out-of-state family, who are devout Catholics, contacted the diocese to report their daughter had joined the slaves. When the FBI interviewed the woman in August, she told them she is there of her own accord, and the FBI could do nothing more, Dallaire said. The FBI would not comment. <sighs> Louis Villarubia, who presents himself as Brother Andre Marie, as an aside, I'm going to refer to him by from here on as Brother Andre Marie, the leader of the Richmond group, said his group was cleared by the investigation, which was sparked when someone lied about the slaves. There isn't anyone here against their will, Brother Marie, Andre Marie said. On Monday, Brother Andre Marie said he had not yet seen the document detailing the sanctions and had no comment. Brother Andre Marie hung up during a phone interview. I wonder why. Richmond Select Group Doug Bursa, a member of the slaves who is known as Brother Anthony Mary, did not respond to requests for comment. So there is a political angle here as well. The slaves are being sanctioned by the church for their stance on the Catholic teaching that there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church. The slaves hold to a strict interpretation of that teaching, while the Vatican holds a more nuanced view. In recent years, Manchester Bishop Peter Lebowski has allowed a priest in good standing from another diocese to minister to the slaves in their congregation, celebrating Mass in the traditional Latin rite, and administering over Catholic sacraments. According to a statement released Monday by the diocese, the slaves have used that allowance to imply that they were an approved Catholic organization. They have never been recognized and they have never been an official Catholic organization, Dallaire said. The diocese has always considered the slaves as individual Catholics and not its own congregation, he said. The sanctions will remain in place until midnight on June 30th. It is hoped the group will come back into compliance with church teaching, Dallaire said. If not, he said, there could be more severe consequences for the group. Such sanctions would be arranged by Lebowski and the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. 
Dallaire did not want to speculate on whether that would involve excommunication. The purpose of the church is to lead people to the means of salvation, not to kick people out, he said. The group also operates a number of websites and publishes magazines and produces radio programs to push their version of Catholicism. All, that, all of that needs to stop for the group to come into compliance, the diocese said. The slaves have also been pegged as a hate group in recent years by the left-leaning Southern Poverty Law Center for statements members have made about Jewish people and homosexuals. I'm really proud of the Catholic Church's decision here, said Heidi Berch of the Southern Poverty Law Center. They've denounced them for years over their anti-Semitism. In 2017, Brother Andre Marie categorically rejected being labeled as a hate group. The group, which moved in the 1980s to Richmond, a town of 1,155 people, according to the 2010 census. It developed a compound, interesting choice of word, that includes living quarters for monks and sisters, a chapel, and a school. Dallaire said about four brothers and eight sisters live there, as well as couples and families. Fewer than 30 children attend an on on-site on school. All of the organizations affiliated with this group are now under orders from the Vatican to stop calling themselves Catholic, and no sacraments are, are permitted on site except for extreme emergencies. Catholics are not permitted under any circumstances to read the sacraments of the Church of the St. Benedict Center and its associated locations, nor should they participate in any activity provided by this group or school, a statement released Monday by the diocese says. Letters are going out to surrounding parishes to inform Catholics about the status change. For slaves who want to attend a Mass, the diocese is instituting a sanctioned Latin Mass for people to attend at St. Stanislaus Parish in Winchester. As of Tuesday, last week, however, the slaves were still posting Mass times on their website. As always, if you want to read that or any other article I read, a link is on the Return to Tradition blog. I'm always at a loss when the secular media attacks the church and her traditionalist institutions and then cites the Southern Poverty Law Center of all groups, which is a legitimate leftist hate group that has an extreme anti-Catholic bias. Obviously, the tone of this article should be a big warning sign. The only thing it's missing is a charge of the group having lefebvreous tendencies, though I suppose we'd see that kind of language from a Catholic Pravda website. After looking at the diocesan letter given to the St. Benedict Center, I've got the 13 prohibitions that were explicitly imposed by the diocese. They are as follows. 1. A prohibition from referring to themselves as a Catholic organization. 2. Prohibition from using the name Catholic to imply a relationship with the Catholic Church. 3. Prohibition from using any means, written, audio, internet, etc. from teaching the faith without the approval of the local ordinary. 4. Prohibition from claiming to represent the faith in any fashion. 5. A prohibition of any sacramental celebrations on site, save for the anointing of the sick in an emergency. 6. Prohibition of reserving the sacred Eucharist in any location on site. 7. An obligation to submit to the traditional Catholic teaching of extra ecclesium nulla salus, per the contemporary teaching. 8. The obligation to change their tax filing status with the state of New Hampshire. 9. The obligation to do the same for the school the St. Benedict Center operates. 10. The obligation to change the federal tax filing status in accordance with the aforementioned state obligation. 11. The obligation to promote the contemporary understanding of the faith and these precepts on St. Benedict Center websites. 12. Prohibition of private and public masses said on site. 13. A prohibition of confession and absolutions heard or given on site. The slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary's founding documents apparently include the Athanasian Creed, which the diocese and the CDF do not recognize as being sufficiently Catholic and, according to the diocese, makes the founding documents null and void. The St. Benedict Center has been given until the 30th of June of 2019 to fully comply under threat of being found quote-unquote obstinate. Let's have a look at the response from the St. Benedict Center. First, in the press release for clarifying doctrinal matters, Brother Andre Marie states, that they hold the view of extra ecclesium nulla salus as taught in the catechism, with, catech with citations of the catechism noted. He goes on to describe the teaching this way, and I'm reading the full, more or less the full letter here. Very Reverend and Dear Father Dallaire, Pax Christi, I acknowledge receipt of your letter dated the 23rd of January 2017. Thank you for your letter. Since that date, in conformity with the invitation of the very Reverend Giacomo Morandi, Undersecretary for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, communicated to me by his letter of 20 October 2016 past, 
I have prayed for the assistance of the Holy Ghost and sought competent theological and canonical counsel, so as to arrive at an understanding of the developed teaching of the Church, and how her teaching is not self-contradictory. Through some misunderstanding, the Undersecretary in his above reference letter asserts that I, quote, indicate that it is permissible to hold the position that these articles contradict what was previously taught, end quote, when instead, quite clearly, I stated in writing the opposite, quote, should we not conclude that there is no change to perennial doctrine, end quote. Contrary to Monsignor Morandi's assertions, nowhere in my letter reference supra did I ever write, as he mistakenly asserts, quote, that these articles, Catechism reference, uh, paragraph reference, 846 and uh, DINN 20 to 22, need not be accepted. To the contrary, I emphatically profess and always professed that the doctrine very clearly artic articulated in Catechism paragraph 846, with its source in Lumen Gentium number 14, is Defide Divini Ex Catholica, referencing paragraph 750. Of the of canon law, I think, as an aside, also the doctrine also known as extra ecclesium nulla salis, in order to dispel any continued misunderstanding as to what my doctrinal positions truly constitute, I infirm the following propositions, all of which is in, all of which in bold print are exer are excerpted from the Under Secretary's letters of 15 April and 20 October 2016. One, the principle extra ecclesium nulla salis must be interpreted according to the official doctrine of the Church, uh, referencing Catechism of the Catholic Church, Numbers 846 to 848, and the Declaration Dominus Iesus, uh, paragraphs 20 to 22. Point two, all salvation comes from Christ through the Church, which is the body of Christ, the sacrament of salvation, referencing Catechism, paragraph 846. Point three, it is equally binding that those who, through no fault of their own, do not know Christ, Evangelium Christi, and his church have the possibility of obtaining consequae possunt, eternal salvation. Reference to the Catechism, paragraph 847. This proposition I affirm in conjunction with all the other conditions sine qua non for salvation explicitly narrated in the Epistola and Archiepiscopalium Bostonesium of A. August 1949, reference in footnote number 342 of the same Catechism, which themselves are referenced as extracted from the encyclical letter Mystici Corpus Christi of Venerable Pope Pius XII, namely 1. Perfecta Caritate, and two, Fide Supernatalem, referencing Hebrews 9, chapter 9, verse 6, and the Council, the Council of Trent, session 6, with the term Fidem ex explicated by Blessed Pope Innocent XI in his decrees of 2nd March 1679, condemning Proposition 23. Point four, the Church certainly has a perennial obligation and sacred right to evangelize all men. Catechism, paragraph 848. Point five, one must hold the Church as necessary for salvation. Uh, Dominus Iesus, paragraph 20. Point six, this doctrine must not be set against the universal salvific will of God. The same, paragraph 20. Point seven, for non-Christians, salvation in Christ is accessible, patens, by virtue of a grace, which, coming from Christ and communicated by the Holy Spirit, has a relationship with the Church and is bestow bestowed by God in ways known to God himself, Dominus Iesus, paragraphs 20 to 21. Since Dominus Iesus, number 21, in its footnote, number 83, explicitly references the decree of the Second Ecumenical Council of the Vatican, Agentis, number 7, I likewise affirm the remainder of the perennial teaching proposed in that conciliar text. He goes into the Latin, which I'll skip because my Latin is awful, but he translates it here, translated. All, therefore, must be converted to him, made known by the church's preaching, and through baptism be incorporated into Christ and to, into his church, which is his body. Even if, therefore, God in ways known to himself can lead men ignorant of the gospel without their fault to the faith, without which it is impossible to please him. Point 8. Dialogue with members of other religions can never substitute the mission of the church, called to bring sal salvation to all. Dominus Iesus, number 22. In complement to the above propositions, I also affirm the following excerpt of Blessed Pope Pius IX's allocation, Singulari Quadrum, of 9th December 1854. Again, a lot of Latin, but he offers a translation here. Translated. 
For it must be held to be of the faith that outside of the apostolic Roman church, no one can be saved, that this is the only ark of salvation, that he who shall not have entered therein will perish in the flood. But on the other hand, it is equally necessary to, to hold for certain that they who labor in ignorance of the true religion, if it be invincible, will not be held as guilty of this condition before the eyes of the Lord. Now, on the contrary, who would arrogate so much to himself as to mark the limits of such an invincible ignorance due to the nature and variety of peoples, regions, innate dispositions, and so many things? Let us hold most firmly that in accordance with the Catholic teaching, there is one God, one faith, one baptism, Ephesians 4, verse 5. It is against the divine will, nephos, to proceed further in inquiry. Since, according to blessed Pope Pius IX, therefore, it is nephos for any human person to attempt to discern whether or not any particular non-Catholic is in a state of invincible reg ignorance regarding our most holy religion, in submission to the teachings of the Magisterium, I profess that I will continue to preach the doctrine of the Second Vatican Council. Namely, all must be converted to Christ made known by the Church, by the Church's preaching, and be incorporated into Christ and His Church through baptism. That is from the uh, doctrine of the Second Vatican Council, the decree Ad Agentis, paragraph 7. If God Almighty chooses to lead a soul in invincible ignorance to him and his church through some extraordinary means, it is in conformity with blessed Pope Pius IX's admonition, supra, not for me to identify whether profession in Jesus Christ as Savior and sacramental baptism is not needed to be imparted to that soul. That is the Almighty's competency. For these reasons, I will, as is required of me, continue to profess the dogma of extra ecclesium nulla salis, proposed by the Magisterium, including the Second Vatican Council, in the way that the Church interprets it. In submission to the official teachings of the Church, which in no manner can ever be contradictory one to another, the undersigned very respectfully request that the Diocese of Manchester archive its doubts as to my personal fidelity to the Church's Magisterium. Thank you for your consideration. I remain yours very respectfully in Christ and in the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Brother Andre Marie. In their press release for January 11th, the St. Benedict Center informs the lay faithful of the censure they've received regarding celebration of the Mass or the sacraments. To quote that release, it is with sorrow that we must inform our many friends and supporters and all the faithful Catholics who have attended the traditional Latin Mass at St. Benedict Center that the Diocese of Manchester has now refused us the services of a priest and has prohibited the administration of the sacraments at the center. We were surprised and disappointed by this decision. We are working to resolve this impasse, and we will keep you informed about our progress. In the meantime, we apologize for the confusion and inconvenience, and ask you to keep us in your prayers. We remain dedicated to the charism of our Founder, and are committed, as we have been for decades, to the spiritual welfare of all the Catholics who have been part of our apostolate. In the press release of January 12th, the St. Benedict Center reaffirms that it is in union with and submission to the Roman Pontiff and his local shepherd, the Bishop, the continued attempts they've made and continue to make to work in goodwill with the local Bishop, and how no one has explained to them how they violate Catholic dogma and doctrinal teachings. That release ends with an expressed desire to dialogue with the Bishop. So what do you think about this? This looks, in my not unbiased opinion, like the targeting of another traditional Catholic order or organization by the powers that be. In my mind, the injustice of this is made clear by the question of Catholic teaching on salvation outside the church by the bishop, which is celebrated by the known hate group, the Southern Poverty Law Center. I'm generally suspicious and hope that this gets resolved without the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary having to water down that teaching to the point of absurdity. After all, if salvation is to be found outside the church, why not leave and join some feel-good Protestant sect that doesn't make nearly as many demands on our lives as the Catholic faith does? But maybe I'm wrong in, to assess it in this way. As an aside, Brother Andre Marie, if you are listening, I'd love to have you on a live stream at some point. Consider this an open invitation. If you like videos like this, like and share this video and subscribe, and click the notification bell below. If you're interested in supporting my work, there are various options in the description below, along with links to my Twitter, the Sources blog, and the Return to Tradition Facebook page. Thanks for listening. I am Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.